since humans have first walked on this planet, they have looked up into the night sky at all those sparkling points of light and wondered, are those other suns shining down on other Earths? Is life unique to our own planet, or has it gotten a toehold somewhere else in the universe? Are we alone? We're on the verge of actually answering that question. This image of a star field that you see behind me, those little boxes in the center of the image, that's where NASA's Kepler Space Telescope has been looking. In the five years, it's been looking at that area of the night sky, which if you went out tonight and put up your thumb, you'd actually be covering about the area of the sky that Kepler has been studying. In that small area of the night sky, Kepler has found over 5,000 planet candidates. 5,000. When I go out to audiences and I speak to kids, I say, you know, when I was a kid, we had nine planets. You guys, you only have eight. But now they have thousands. Thousands. And what about those thousand planets are we so interested in? We're looking for a habitable planet around another star, an Earth 2.0, if you will. This is an image of our planet by NASA's EPIC camera on NOAA's Discover spacecraft. And it really shows what we're looking for, that blue dot, that blue marble out in space because it's a water planet that we're looking for. We think that water is critical to life. Water has unique properties. It's a solvent. Lots of things dissolve in it, like nutrients that are critical for life. Water is also very unique in that it occurs in all three phases, gas, liquid, and solid, in a relatively narrow temperature range. So we really think that water is critical for life. So we're looking for that blue planet out in space. And we're on the verge of actually really being able to study it. This is the James Webb Space Telescope, which is being built right now at our Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. James Webb is our next generation space telescope, following on the Hubble Space Telescope. It's made up of 18 mirrors, each mirror about the size of a coffee table. The Hubble Space Telescope actually orbits the Earth, but the James Webb Space Telescope will orbit the Sun about a million miles from the Earth. And when it's deployed out in space, those 18 mirrors will act together as one 21-foot mirror. And a space telescope has advantages over a ground-based telescope here on Earth. For one thing, it can operate 24-7. It doesn't have to wait for it to be night. And it doesn't have to worry about atmospheric conditions like we do with telescopes here on this planet. So what is the James Webb Space Telescope going to do? It's going to look further and further into space, deeper into space, almost to the time of the Big Bang, to understand what happened in the very earliest time period of the universe. What was, how were galaxies forming? How were stars forming? How were planetary systems forming? But even more importantly, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to look at the atmospheres of some of those planets that Kepler has discovered around other stars. It's looking in for planets in what we call the habitable zone, or sometimes we call the Goldilocks zone. You know, right now Venus is too hot, Mars is too, too cold, and the Earth is just right. Just right for what? Liquid water on the surface. So we're looking for that planet just the right distance from its parent star where water could be stable on the surface. And then James Webb is going to look at the gases in that atmosphere. Now, what kind of gases are we looking for? Well, the ones we know from here on Earth, an atmosphere like ours, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, methane, gases that we associate with life. Now, if we find that, is that proof of life? No, it's just consistent, saying maybe this planet could be habitable. What we'd really like to do over time is to see changes in those gases that would indicate there's something dynamic going on. Now, that could be volcanism, 
but we would hope maybe it could be life. Now, to image that planet around another star, we need a really powerful telescope that right now we need to invest in technology in order to be able to build. And in fact, it might be, have to be so big that we would actually have to build it in space. So I hope that happens in our lifetime or definitely in my children's lifetime. But James Webb is really going to move us along this path of trying to find that habitable planet, that Earth 2.0. Now, when we think about life, it's important to reflect back on life here on Earth. Behind me, you see volcanic vents on Earth's ocean floor. They're called black smokers or white smokers because of that stuff coming out the top of them. Earth, uh, here on Earth, life began in the oceans. The Earth formed about 4.6 billion years ago, about 700 million years after the Earth formed, around the time when conditions stabilized. Life evolved here on Earth, but it stayed in the oceans for over a billion years. And in fact, it's only in about the last 500 million years that more complex life forms as we know them, land, plants, fish, evolved. And it's only been 200,000 years since we've had humans on this Earth. So from our one data point of our one planet, we think that life might be easy, but complex life is likely to be hard. But these black smokers that we see on the Earth's ocean floors are extremely rich environments for life. Coming out of those volcanic eruptions are all kinds of nutrients. And so even in this extreme environment, deep under the ocean where there's no sunlight, in extremely hot water, life is flourishing. NASA-funded researchers have gone around the globe to places like the dry valleys of Antarctica, the Atacama Desert of Chile, one of the driest places on Earth. These places are great analogs for, for planets like Mars, where we think that life might have evolved. And what have those researchers found? They found that life persists here on Earth, even in these very extreme environments. Deep in the oceans, you, you go down in the Marianas Trench, which is a deep gash in the, ocean, the Pacific Ocean floor, Five miles down, we still can find fish adapted to that dark environment. Seven miles down, researchers, researchers have been stunned to see that microbes are teeming in the water. Life persists on this earth and is very common. And that's what gives us confidence when we go out into the solar system. And it makes us wonder, could there be life in our own solar system, in our own celestial backyard. So where do we go to look? Well, one of the things we're focusing on at NASA are the ocean worlds of the outer solar system. So now we're moving away from that concept of a habitable zone. On these worlds, so far out in our own solar system, out by Jupiter, Saturn, water's no longer stable on the surface. It's too cold. In fact, the surfaces of these moons are actually made of water ice, but so hard that it behaves like rock. So where are the oceans? They're beneath those icy crusts, deep water oceans, maybe a mile or so be below the surface. This bottom image is Enceladus. It's a moon of Saturn. And those bright plumes you see erupting, like geysers, are coming from Enceladus's subsurface liquid ocean. We've flown NASA's Cassini spacecraft right through those plumes. That's how come we know they're water. We've also measured minerals that indicate there might be some of those eruptions, like those black smokers we were just looking at, in Enceladus's subsurface oceans. And we've even measured organic molecules. But our instrument on Cassini wasn't sophisticated enough to tell us exactly what they were. We're always looking for things, say, like amino acids. We, we've found amino acids on, on comets, in interstellar clouds, and those are the building blocks of life on Earth. So we want to go back to Enceladus and study those eruption plumes in more detail. Europa is the moon on the upper right. It's a moon of Jupiter, icy crust, subsurface liquid ocean, just like Enceladus. All those cracks you see on the, on the surface, that's from the ocean moving around below the surface. In the mid-2020s, NASA's going to send a spacecraft to Europa 
which we'll figure out. What is that kind of orangey brown gunk on the surface? Could it be organic material? Could Europa have erupting plumes like Enceladus where we could go and figure out? Is there life in those subsurface oceans? Every time we measure one of those volcanic events here on Earth, again, extremely rich environments for life. And that's what makes us so optimistic about Europa, about Enceladus. Now, the moon on the upper left, it's a bit of a different story. It's another moon of Saturn called Titan. Titan is the only moon in the solar system with an atmosphere. Its atmosphere is, almost, uh, is mostly nitrogen, like Earth's atmosphere. It rains on Titan. Titan has rivers, lakes, seas. But it's extremely cold on the surface of Titan. Remember, it's in orbit around Saturn, 90 million miles from the Earth. So what is that fluid that's raining? It turns out it's liquid methane and liquid ethane, basically gasoline. How exotic is that? But again, it rains, it forms rivers, it forms seas. Now, I have gone on and on about how important water is to life, but what, what if we're wrong? What if we're only seeing a small piece of the puzzle because of what we know about Earth? What if all you need is a fluid? Titan would help us push the limits of what we understand about life. What are the limits of life? Does it require water? Could it look very different from life on Earth? Titan's an important piece of that puzzle. And plus, how cool would it be to sail a boat on an alien sea? But if you look across the solar system, let's come back to the habitable zone. And Mars is definitely NASA's most important target to really get at this question, did life evolve beyond Earth? We know from the landers and orbiters that NASA and other space agencies around the world have sent to Mars, we know that Mars had water on its surface very early in its history. And our Curiosity rover, which has been studying Mount Sharp, this mountain that you see behind me, it's been climbing up Mount Sharp slowly and reading each of those layers of Mars' surface. Because to a geologist, each of those layers of rock is like a page in the history book of Mars. So we go and we look at those layers, and what has it been telling us? It's been telling us that water was not only stable on the surface of Mars for on the order of a billion years, the environment was actually fairly conducive to life. But then Mars lost its magnetic field, which protected its atmosphere, we know from our NASA's MAVEN spacecraft that the solar wind, the stream of particles coming from the sun, started to strip the top layers of Mars' atmosphere away. Mars got cold, its atmosphere got very thin. The water either went underground or was lost to space. And what about if there had been life on Mars? Would life have gone underground in that extreme environment that suddenly transitioned to on Mars? Or did it go? Did it go extinct so that the only evidence we could find today would be of fossil microbes? Because remember, Earth life, after about a billion years in the ocean, was still only about single-celled or multi-celled life. It wasn't very complex. So while NASA's rovers and orbiters are important, I think it's going to take humans, and not just any humans, but geologists, astrobiologists, people like me, on the surface of Mars, cracking open a lot of rocks, analyzing them, to really find out if life evolved on Mars. Because again, those fossil microbes are going to be hard to find. So NASA right now is embarked on a journey to Mars. The president has a goal of getting humans to Mars in the 2030s. And NASA is going to do it with our international partners, and with the private sector. We work on it every day. And those humans are really critical, again, to answering this question of are we alone. Of all the images that NASA has taken, this one I find the most awe-inspiring and the most humbling. It's called the Hubble Deep Field Image. The Hubble Space Telescope looked 
for days at the darkest area of the sky where there seemed to be nothing. It looked past our Milky Way galaxy, past nearby galaxies, getting light from extremely far away. And when a telescope is getting light from far away, it takes so long for those photons to reach your telescope, you're actually looking back in time. This image that you can see, these galaxies behind me, those aren't stars, those are galaxies. Those galaxies formed about 500 million years after the Big Bang, about 13 billion years ago. Incredible complexity, incredible beauty in the very, very early universe. From our Hubble Space Telescope, we know there are billions of galaxies. We know in each of those billions of galaxies, there are billions of stars. How many of those stars have solar systems like ours, have Earth 2.0s? We have the technology. We know where to go. We know what to measure. We will go to Mars, not just with robotic spacecraft, but with humans, to find out if life ever evolved on the red planet. We will go to the ocean worlds of the outer solar system, Enceladus, Europa, even Titan, to find out what are the limits of life in our solar system. And we will continue to use our powerful telescopes to answer that fundamental question. Are we alone. Thank you.